Well, thank you for the invitation to speak at the International Foundation for Gastro Gastrointestinal Disorders Annual Advocacy Event. As a director of the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases, I'm pleased to share with you this overview of neurogastroenterology research supported by the NIH and by NIDDK in particular. The next slide, the NIDDK and the IFFGD have a strong history together, and we greatly appreciate the work that the foundation has done to provide a voice for people with functional GI disorders and to promote awareness of these disorders to members of Congress and the general public. We also appreciate the foundation's interaction with us through the Digestive Disease National Coalition and the Friends of NIDDK. As you probably know, the foundation's founder and past president, Nancy Norton, was a member of our advisory council from 2001 to 2005, and Nancy's personal story was featured in our 2014 edition of our annual publication, NIDDK Recent Advances and Emerging Opportunities. I'm also happy to welcome the foundation's current president, Cecile Rucker, to participate in our advisory council starting this September. On the next slide, support uh, for research on neurogastroenterology spans across many institutes at NIH, but NIDDK is the lead institute for this research. This is in line with NIDDK's mission a substantial part of which is to conduct and support medical research and research training on digestive diseases. These include a myriad of functional disorders like irritable bowel syndrome, gastroparesis, fecal incontinence, achalasia, functional dyspepsia, and gastrointestinal reflux disease. Our institute supports neurogastroenterology research uh, and other institutes, such as the National Institute of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, and the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. The NIH Office of the Director also supports neurogastroenterology research through the NIH Common Fund and through offices like the Office of Research on Women's Health. The NIDDK often works with these other NIH components to coordinate this research. Next slide, please. For example, the Stimulating Peripheral Activity to Relieve Conditions Program, or SPARC, which everything in the government has an acronym, is a joint venture between the NIH's Common Fund and multiple institutes, including NIDDK. As you may know, peripheral nerves make connection with and influence the function of every organ in the body. SPARC is funding high-risk, goal-driven research to accelerate the development of therapeutic devices that control electrical activity in peripheral nerves, ultimately improving the function of organs, including those in that GI tract. Current SPARC projects include research in mapping the mesh-like systems of nerves that surround the GI tract to better understand how these nerves control gastric function. SPARC is also testing medical devices that communicate with these nerves as potential treatments and research tools for gastroparesis, fecal incontinence, and other GI disorders. Next slide, please. To better understand GI disorders, NIDDK-supported research have also been creating small organoids, or mini guts, generated from intestinal stem cells. These organoids can be used as models to study human GI disorders in a laboratory setting. For example, members of the NIDDK's Intestinal Stem Cell Consortium have succeeded in generating intestinal organoids with functional nerve cells. They're using these organoids as a model to study disorders such as Hirschsprung's disease, where the nerves that govern the function of the gastrointestinal tract are missing. The image on the left shows these organoids look like under a microscope, and the video on the right shows an organoid that was transplanted into a mouse. The organoid in the video has an embedded nervous system, and uh, as you can see, uh, if the video is working, 
the wave-like contractions that are caused by the neural activity. These are very similar to uh, what you would see in the human gastrointestinal tract. On the next slide, we see that human intestinal cells share space in the gut with trillions of microbes that can influence the health and disease, sometimes in very surprising ways. NIDDK has been investing in research to understand the complex interaction between the microbiome and its human host. For example, research supported by NIDDK in conjunction with the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health is investigating changes in the gut microbiome and also in the brain in response to cognitive behavior therapy for irritable bowel syndrome. And because irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS, disproportionately affects women, this project is also looking at how biological sex differences, such as sex hormones, could influence these changes. By exploring the connection between the brain, the gut microbiome, and sex differences, these studies have the potential to identify who would possibly be highly responsive to cognitive behavioral therapy. Next slide, please. Now, there are many factors that shape the gut microbiome, but one of the most critical is diet. In fact, diet and nutrition play important roles in many aspects of GI and metabolic health. In this regard, it's my privilege to serve as a chair of the NIH Nutrition Research Task Force, which has recently developed an NIH-wide strategic plan for nutrition research. The focus of this plan is on the field of precision nutrition with strategic goals and cross-cutting areas to answer key questions in nutrition science, like what do we eat and how does it affect us? What and when should we eat? How does what we eat promote healthy living across a lifespan? And how can we improve the use of food as medicine? In a nutshell, the strategic plan lays out a bold vision for accelerating progress in nutrition science and for developing individualized, actionable dietary recommendations. Next slide. The NIDDK is also renewing support for the Gastroparesis Clinical Research Consortium. This consortium is made up of several clinical research centers across the country allowing researchers to share techniques and tools and, importantly, to assemble a broad spectrum of hundreds of people with gastroparesis who volunteer to participate in the gastroparesis research. The largest clinical and physiologic data repository for gastroparesis in the world. In addition to the adult registry, the consortium has also recently established the first prospective pediatric gastroparesis registry in the nation. Over recent years, the consortium completed an observational study to understand risk factors and how gastroparesis develops, along with clinical trials to test new therapeutic approaches to treat and manage gastroparesis symptoms. And in future years, the consortium will continue to pursue observational and clinical research to understand gastroparesis, and it will continue to develop better means to diagnose, treat, and the clinical management of gastroparesis in children and adults. On the next slide, another GI disorder, one that's very common and presents significant public health burden, is fecal incontinence. The NIDDK sponsored fecal incontinence treatment, or FIT study, is comparing the effectiveness of three treatments three different treatments, rather, biofeedback, sacral nerve stimulation, and an injectable bulking agent. Now, this is a good example of a difficult study that would not likely have been undertaken by the private sector, largely because com it's comparing the effectiveness of already established treatments. And it should be noted that the clinical studies like this are especially challenging during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. During NIDDK's last advisory council meeting, which was held remotely, 
We asked the Council for their insights on the scope of COVID-19 impact on NIDDK-supported research, from basic science to clinical and translational science, to training and career development, and on how NIDDK can assist in restarting research activities. Many issues were considered, uh, such as the increased cost for conducting research safely in the current institutional environments, the loss of revenue to support research at academic institutions, particularly those that are hospital-based, and the disproportionate effects of the pandemic on investigators with school-aged children, on young investigators, and on investigators who are part of an underrepresented minority group in this country. Our counselors also highlighted challenges to the very conduct of clinical research, such as the accommodations that need to be made for safety of all involved, fear or reluctance on the part of participants in clinical trials, and the inability to collect outcome data and biosamples. Next slide, please. When it came to ideas for how to mitigate the impacts uh, and the role of NIDDK and NIH, three common themes emerged. They were policy flexibility, policy accommodation, and targeted investments. Council members provided a number of suggestions along these lines for our consideration. And, and many of these issues and challenges raised are obviously not unique to NIDDK. NIH has been working hard to try to get in front of these issues that the pandemic has created for the research community and several recommendations made by our council members have been addressed at a trans NIH level. For example, NIH has provided uh, flexibility and human subjects research project extensions and managing project costs. However, NIDDK will do what we can do so that researchers can continue the important work needed to address the root biological, social, and economic causes of chronic disease and develop ways to combat these conditions. And importantly, I want to highlight NID's com D DDK's commitment to understanding health disparities that have contributed to racial inequities that have been highlighted by recent events. This will be an important part of our strategic plan and also an important and ongoing part of our research programs to understand the causes of health disparities for diseases within our missions, including how those diseases may be contributing to COVID-19 disparities. If I can have the next slide. Well, this brings me to the final portion of my talk. I, I'd like to take this opportunity to mention another major effort that NIDDK has undertaken, a five-year strategic plan for the Institute. As you may know, Congress mandated in the 21st Century Cures Act that every NIH institute develop an institute strategic plan. While NIDDK has previously focused on disease-specific strategic planning, such as in GI diseases, we're taking this opportunity to develop an overarching plan for the entire institute. This plan will complement our disease-specific planning efforts and will be a five-year plan to present a broad vision for the future and to demonstrate the value of NIDDK research now and going forward. Importantly, we view this as an opportunity to gain ideas from leading researchers and patient advocates across NIDDK's mission areas. Next slide, please. So as part of the strategic planning process, we are asking for your valuable input on the plan from the research and patient communities and on others who have an interest in the research within the mission of NIDDK. A request for information or RFI has been released. There's still a few days to respond. The RFI closes on July the 31st. So we invite all of you to submit your ideas. Links to the RFI are posted on the NIH guide, in the Federal Registry, and on the NIDDK's website. The final slide, please. I hope that this brief talk has given you some highlights of the kinds of research NIDDK is supporting. Thank you again for giving me this opportunity to share with you 
advances that we're making in neurogastroenterology. We're very excited to build upon this progress as we continue to improve the lives of people affected by GI disorders. Thank you so much.